Welcome to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast, where the cross and the culture are on a collision course for discussion. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, here's your host, Thomas Irvin. Welcome back to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast. I greet you again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is worthy of our service. This podcast is made available to you from beautiful Masaka, Uganda, on the continent of Africa. I pray you enjoyed part one of our interview with Brother Ed Worth. This will be part two. I greatly appreciate his openness, his humility, and his faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. It has been amazing to interview various men and learn how they came to know the Lord. Now we're going to pick up in this interview right where we left off in part one. Let's get started. From there, how did your desire to, you know, you, you, you are very faithful to the Bible and especially the study of the Bible. How, how did your desire for the Word of God, and then you ended up in, in a Bible school, and which eventually led you to Bible school in the Bible Baptist Church, how did that process kind of take place? And, and how did your, you know, what, what happened from the time you got saved to, to develop that love and desire that you have to, to know and study the Word of God? Well, my wife, my wife told me one time, she said, Ed, when you do something, when you set your mind to something, you, you do it until it's thoroughly done. You, right. you, you're, you're extreme when you're doing whatever you're doing. You, you, you don't, I guess in a sense, in my mind, as I'm looking at what she's saying, like, I, I don't, I can't, it's sometimes it's hard for me to balance things. Right. If I set my mind to something, I'm only focused on that. So Mm -hmm. my focus is only that. Sure. So somebody else could come along and say, Hey, could you help me with this? No, I'm, I'm doing this. (laughs) Yeah. And so if it was making music, like when I was, you know, in my younger days, I would, I would make music or I would learn a program on how to make music. Mm -hmm. And then, Becky would see how I do it. And I wouldn't, I, I, 16, 17 hours, I'd be focused on just that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat. Uh, I, I'd sacrifice my sleep to, to just learn it. Yeah. And then I, until I got it completely done, I thoroughly under, understand it. That's kind of how I was because I knew I wasn't smart. And I knew, I, I mean, in, I mean, obviously in the sense of, you know, photostatic memory, and sure, just being sure. able to do things on the fly like that. I was more of the guy, I needed repetition, 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 repetition. And I guess in a sense, if you want to look at that as smart to be able to have diligence to do repetitious things till you can learn it, then, then okay, I can agree with that. But uh, me, I didn't think of myself in that way. So I was like, I have to constantly right. repeat, repeat, right. repeat, repeat, repeat. So that's what I did. And so when it came to, after getting saved, I was challenged with, are you a Christian? And if you're a Christian, are you living the, first of all, are you living a Christian life? Which I knew I wasn't. Right. And second of all, if you're a Christian, do you know how to answer your belief system? And I couldn't do that. Sure. 
And I was upset that I couldn't, number one, I was frustrated because I, I didn't have a desire to live the Christian life. Right. I, I was glad I was saved. Right. And number two, knowing the word of God to me was like, that's for preachers. That's for people that are in the church that are serving in the church. Yeah. That's got nothing to do with me. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That was my mindset. That's a common mindset. I, I think probably far more than it should be. It's a shame. And, and it's, it really is contradictory to what a church member ought to be like you're right. saying. Right. So I guess what was really the turning point was me when when I was going to church and I was being challenged with that by the pastor, uh, Pastor Mickey Robinson, the pastor of Victory Baptist Church in Coppers Cove, Texas at that time mm -hmm. before Pastor Eric Knight took over, uh, who was my associate pastor that really took me under his wing to disciple me. Um, the pastor really challenged me. Uh, pastor Robinson really challenged me on you know, am I just a Christian by by name or by title or by tag, mm -hmm. not Christian by by lifestyle and testimony of my outward actions and inward beliefs? So when he challenged me with that, it was like, you know, he's looking inside my life and how does he know that I'm viewing it, my life this way? And I'm like, yeah, he can see this. Yeah. He can see this, that I'm not doing this. Right. And to me, it was like, it, it, even though it's coming from a man that, that's behind a pulpit that believes the Bible, in my mind as a carnal Christian, I was like, that's, this is God speaking to me. Sure. It, it, a little bit, you know, it, it may be charismatic for some folks to think that, but I, I think in ways that God actually does, but uh, charismaticism aside, I think that there's, that's how God works. He works through the scriptures. He works through people. Now that I'm looking now back, I, I saw that, that it was really God speaking to me. Right. And, but he challenged me on those basic things in which those basic things started getting more and more, you know, one door opened up another door and that door opened up another door. And so when Eric Knight came on the scene. Pastor Eric Knight came on the scene. He was new to our, to that church, mm -hmm. and I wasn't even faithfully going at the time. It was right. an off and on thing. Right. We were still going out to raves. We were going out to clubs <laughs> at the time. Yeah. So I mean, we're still living and doing a lot of sinful things. Right. And so I'm still at this church. You know, I'm I'm trying to direct my mind the right way as I'm at church, but I I don't I can't seem to really grasp what's being expected of me. Sure. And. And, and, and it was my own blind ignorance that it was my lifestyle that I was trying to justify. Right. So when Eric Knight came on the scene, he was new. And I was, because I, I was already, dis another thing, I was really discouraged in going to church. Uh -huh. And one of the major things that discouraged me was there wasn't nobody there my age. Gotcha. I didn't want to go to church because all the people were like 70 and over. <laughs> yeah. So there's no young people I could confide in. Right. And, all, and all the older folks were like, uh, yeah, that, that's just a young buck, you know, and they, they wouldn't reach out to me. Sure. I mean, some some people, I, I won't speak for everybody, but still with some people that did, because I remember a few, uh, few of the brothers in that church that did reach out to me. So I believe that when Eric Knight came on the scene, he was younger. I mean, I'm about eight, I think about eight months older than he is. Oh, wow. So, I mean, he's, he's around my, my age group. Mm -hmm. So when he started there as associate pastor, I was kind of like, you know, what's this guy going to teach me? You know, I mean, I know these Bible codes, you know, and I, I'm all up in, I know equidistant letter sequences. <laughs> what's this guy going to teach me, you know? Yeah. And when he started, he started, he started laying in on like conduct, Christian conduct, pride. Yeah. He started going in on all these things. And I'm like, whoa, this is man, just rubbing me the wrong way right here, right, you know? Right. And finally he reached out to the the young couples in the church. Cause it was when he got there, more young couples started coming. Okay. And so there was a lot of younger guys that were coming and me and Becky were really happy because we had people to talk to now. Yeah. And so 
then he started this young couples, uh, this young couples group, this little ministry, and he was going to have it in the evenings uh, during the week. Yeah. So we'd go there, and, and you know, he asked us, "We want to come," and we're like, "Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go." You know, and I mean, he and I, I went home and told Becky, "Yeah, you know, I thought he thought he was all that, but you know, he reached out to us. You know, he's he's a good guy. You yeah. know, let's just yeah. go ahead and do it." <laughs> so we went out there and. The, the the first class, I'll tell you, this is what really changed my perspective and got me to be more objective about my Christian life right. and the Bible and what I believe and everything. It was the very first class where uh, Brother Knight said, well, thank you guys for joining us for the class. Th th thank you for everybody coming out and everything. He says, so I, I want to provoke you as we start this class with a question. And he says, do you believe that the King James Bible uh -oh. is the inspired, preserved <laughs> Word of God? Yeah, that's that's that was the. I I don't know if it's exactly because it's a while back, but yeah, yeah, that was how I understood it. Sure, and I sat there and I just had this dumbfounded look on my face. I know I did because I never thought about it. Right, and my the Bible that I had that I went to class with was an amplified Bible. Okay. And I thought one Bible is as good as another. Right. And I did not see the big deal or the big difference <laughs> in yeah. those. I, the word of God is the word of God. I, you know, if you got a Bible, you go down to the Christian store and you buy a Bible. This is my, my thinking. You, you're you buying the word of God. Right. You know, no matter if it's a, you know, they didn't have an ESV at the time, but sure. uh, RSV or, you know, what new, new American standard, you're, you're buying a bio, you're buying the word of God. You have, I, and, and I wouldn't even say the gist of what God said. You have what God said. Yeah. And that's, that's my mindset. Cause I never thought of thinking any deeper. It was a very vain kind of thinking. Right. And so, so I'm there and I'm actually now being challenged to think deeper about. <laughs> yeah the the tool that I'm using to get the word of God from. And I'm like, yeah, this, I don't know. I don't know. So he says, raise your hand if you believe that the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved word of God. So he asked us to raise our hands. <laughs> <laughs> and like a few people raised their hands and some people didn't. So I looked at Becky. I'm looking around to see what everybody else is doing, right? So, so I'm looking at Becky like, yeah, I, I don't. I, I'm going to stay on safe ground. I want to raise. All of my a sudden, hand. The, the loner wants to fit in, huh? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. And and you know, I don't want to raise my hand because I don't want to go on a. I don't want to get asked any questions right. about it because right. I don't know anything. Right. So I didn't raise my hand, and uh, so I mean, looking back on that, like, whoa, man, I did that, didn't I? Yeah, but uh, but I didn't know. I mean, there. Sure, it's just sure. I was just ignorant. I I, don't, I I wouldn't say I was willingly ignorant. I was just ignorant. I mean, I was willing to be taught. Uh, I didn't want to remain in my ignorance. Right. And uh, so I'm I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, wow, this is this first class is already like, wow, it's challenging me. Sure. And so I I was really engaged. I was not bored at all. Wow. And I and most of the time when I'm at church, I'm bored. I'm me and Becky are sitting in the back of the pews. <laughs> and right when we pray that close in prayer, we're the first out ones the out the door, <laughs> the first ones to the house. And I'm just like, wow, I'm, just, I'm glad. I mean, the, the people were coming towards us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, that's uh but that's how I used to be. And and that's the respect of the loner in me, you know. So that so that him challenging you that way kind of opened me up, sparked the, the, yes. uh, an overwhelming interest in yes. studying and knowing the Bible. So how did you get from there to Deland, Florida? Okay. Well, the more I was, uh, getting revealed truth in these classes, right. uh, I was getting challenged not only to my, my beliefs as far as the source of truth, which is the King James Bible, sure. but that I'm, I'm not only to, to just to believe that it's the truth, but I'm to apply it to my life. And that was the, one of the other major challenges that I had to uh, end up, you know, dealing with in my life, in my Christian life is, and it was in contrast to my hypocrisy right. of my lifestyle that right. I, I knew I was going to have to get rid of. Sure. And I did not, it was just something I just wasn't looking forward to doing. But the more classes we took, the more I was getting persuaded that, because uh, it wasn't only just teaching the King James Bible. I mean, he was teaching, you know, couples classes on 
how to treat one another in the in the marriage and also uh, personal Christian lifestyle and witnessing and evangelism and and in our church just is just like our in that church in Victory Baptist Church in Coppers Cove it was mainly like most churches that are around America you'll have like maybe 2%, maybe 1% of the church is actually doing evangelism. So it wasn't like an overwhelming uh, uh, group of people that can right, really give right. you peer pressure to provoke you to do good works in witnessing and evangelism. So to me, it was more of, okay, is this the weird group? Or is this, you know, this bunch of weirdos that just meet each other and <laughs> nobody else seems to be in agreement with it. So is it really scriptural? Is it really biblical? Right. As a carnal Christian looking at this, yeah. you know, and I'm wanting to go to the prayer meetings. I'm wanting to go to the, you know, outreaches and I'm just seeing a, just a tiny little handful of people. And to me, it's like, yeah, maybe if I miss out on a few of these, it, it's not going to hurt anything, <laughs> but it, it really was. Cause sure. it was like, sure. And anybody that was there, which I remember uh, one particular uh, godly lady, Sister Betty, she was, uh, oh, wow. She was really an inspiration for witnessing. And, oh, man, she, she's like a machine. I and mean, she, she never missed. She's always there. And so uh, to me, it was like, that, what a real encouragement, an older lady who was always faithful to go uh, witnessing whether people were there or not. If even if even if uh, Brother Knight wasn't there, like he had s- some prior engagement, he had to go to hospital, right. visit somebody. She was there. Wow! It's just all by herself. And so we we we'd show up, we'd go, and it, more and more, I started being persuaded to go door knocking, uh-huh. and because it, it started, that's how I started. Started off with door knocking. Yeah. And so we'd go door knocking, and we go all around, you know, Killeen, and we go to the or or Cove. Copper's Cove, because that's where the church was. So we'd meet from there and mainly go in Cove area. And then we'd go to uh to posts. We went to to the post a few times right. and knocked on doors. And the hardest thing that I've ever found, and I'm telling you, this is all ties in together with how more doors were being opened to me and knowledge of doctrine in the Bible and sure. how I'm gonna end up in this uh in this Bible school here in Deland, Florida. Um, it was dealing with people on a one-on-one basis, right. I found that I couldn't provide substantial answers <laughs> to yeah. people yeah. that were sincerely wanting to know legitimate answers for legitimate problems. Right. And they weren't really trying to down God or or destroy my faith in God. They were just saying they didn't have any faith in God because nobody could supply them with the answers right. to their uh, very, very traumatic experiences and questions sure now i'm dealing with soldiers that went to afghanistan and oh yeah and yeah and uh just went to the wars and a lot of these guys have did uh i'm, I'm saying not not willing fully but just obeying orders that have killed people right that have killed pregnant women uh and not meaning to do so sure and just sure and these pe- these women you end up getting caught in a crossfire and and these guys can't forgive themselves. I talked to a lot of these guys. There's not just I'm not just talking about one particular case. I've talked to a lot of these guys, and I found it very problematic that uh, God, why are you putting me, right, somebody that actually got you know chaptered out of the military who right. didn't do anything productive in the military to deal with military people that I can't even I can't even you know I, I have no. What's what's the word I'm looking for? You know, you have sympathy and you have uh, putting yourself in their shoes. Right. You don't have that that practical experience to be able to really to really understand or em- to, empathy. Yeah, to have the empathy to help them. Right. So the empathy is what I didn't have, and I was in me. I was like at the time because I'm still carnal. Right? I'm, I'm asking God. I'm questioning God. Why sure. are you putting me here? You know, I, I, it just doesn't make any sense. I'm not the guy to do this. I can't answer these guys' questions. I have no experience in that area. I can't put myself in their shoes. So little by little, I'm I'm asking, you know, Pastor Knight or Brother Knight, you know, I'm like, brother, I I can't talk to these guys. I mean, just knocking on five doors, I'm already like, I don't even want to talk to anybody else. I just want to go home. I don't want to deal with nobody anymore because I I can't talk to them. I, I, I have no ability to get them to the gospel when they don't want to just talk about the word of God only. Right. <laughs> and, right. And, and, and so he was teaching me over, you know, a span of time. 
he taught me that, you know, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with human beings. You're not dealing with, with, you know, little ticks on the belt. You're sure. Not, you're not just trying to get people safe so you can just, you know, look at me, you know? So I needed to get my eyes focused off of me. And I think that's what was, was the problem. And I, and I recognized that. So more and more as I was witnessing more, still going out to the bars and the clubs, <laughs> yeah. going door to door more, going, still going out to the bars and the clubs. I started finding out that my lifestyle is rendering me ineffective sure. to do anything productive for God. Absolutely. And so one day, and here it is, I'm telling you, the, we're talking about big turning points in somebody's life here. One day, me and Becky, it, 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 we, were, we went to a rave. Okay, I had, I had a, a few of my so-called uh, friends right. you know, when I'm mainly a loner, but I had a few of my friends. Right. And, uh, you know, we did a lot, a lot of uh, dancing and break dancing and stuff because I was in a break <laughs> dance group. Sure, sure. We'd go down there and do some, uh, I'd do some break dancing. And so Becky would be there with me and, and she, she was so bored. She was so bored there. Right? <laughs> and, she, and she would find uh, a, a chair or a, or a little lounge chair. And she would literally go to sleep. <laughs> She'd go to sleep in the chair. Every rave we went to, she'd find a chair and go to sleep no in No way. It. There, was a, there was very few times when she would like, so th there was very few times where she would actually, you know, participate with me and we'll go dance or something. So she was, just wasn't in it. And one time we were at a rave in Dallas and I remember, I remember it like, like it was date, like it, like it was yesterday. I mean, I remember it. And it, it just became so clear to me. I'm listening to this techno music. I'm looking at Becky. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at the lights. And I'm, I'm telling Becky, the 50, 60,000 watt speakers going. Yeah. You can feel the thump inside your body. And I'm looking at Becky and I'm saying, this is really vain, isn't it? Yeah. This is, this is like, this is a, this is contradictory to what we say we are as Christians. Right. And Becky's like, yeah, I just don't, I really don't want to be here. Amen. And I said, you know what? I don't want to be here either. And right then when we said that, we walked out. Wow. And never went to a club or a bar ever since. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and we got to church. We didn't announce it to anybody. Sure. And, but we just kept, we kept witnessing. We kept serving God. And I think for some, it would be a little decision. But for us, it was big and huge because our desires were into that. Right, right. My desire, brother, at that time was I was in the club from 8 o'clock in the evening wow. to 4 in the morning. Wow. I would open the club and close the club because I was all about dancing. I was all about break dancing. Uh, that's all I was. I mean, and remember what my, I told you about my wife when she told me, when you put your time and sure. effort into something, you go all out. Yeah. And that's what, that's where my, I went all out. I learned, I went break dance. I practiced, we practiced three, four times a week for four hours. Wow. And we were deep into it. I mean, I was just, every break dance competition there was, I was in it. And, and even the guys knew that I was a diligent in, Whenever I need to learn something, I'll practice and practice and practice until I got it. Yeah. And, and Becky could see that diligence. And shifting over to how I am now, I carried over some of the zeal and the diligence and tried to shift it over to, and I, it was a lot of work to do it, but I shifted over to applying those things to the Lord and to the Bible and to my Christian conduct. Yeah. And everywhere where I saw my own hypocrisy, I said, I'm as much as a desire as I had for sin and the things that I was sold out to do in this uh, worldly flesh and the life that I lived in this world. I'm going to devote that. I'm going to I'm going to sell out to God as much as I can and Amen. as much as God will allow me yeah. to. And and I did. I I I, I did. I, I'm not saying I'm a complete work in progress. By no means am I. But the same equal desires that I had for sure. doing the sinful things. I did. I did. I, I, I placed that in the Jesus Christ. I placed that into a uh, Christian conduct. So now I, I just made it a habit to just love the things of God. Wow. And again, I, 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 I fall short or I come short in a lot of areas. I know that, but I did. I, 
I practiced what I what I thought in my own mind that I wanted to do. And now when I look back, I don't see complete hypocrisy there anymore. I don't see when I look at my life now, I, I struggle, I, I have things, but I, I don't have to sit there and say, wow, you are literally living a contradictory lifestyle. Right. And now I can look back on my life and say, you know what? There may people that there may be people out there that completely disagree with what I'm doing and how I'm living. But I know when I stand before God that I can say that for the zeal that I had for sin and the zeal that I had for all these things that had nothing to do with God, I can at least look God in the face and say, God, I, I'm not, I'm not what you, what you, what you want me to be as a complete conformity to Christ, but I, I, you can see the evidence that I did make the changes that yeah. I did try to do right by you. So it beat me up over long periods of time because I would find myself wanting to drift back to doing some old sure. things. Yeah. And, and I think all of us have that problem in some respect or in different temperaments, but um, I struggle all the time and I don't, I don't want to get that impression that somehow through this testimony that I'm giving that, Right now, I'm just this pinnacle of spirituality. It's by no means. I I see myself as in need of more learning, in need of more conformity to Jesus Christ than ever before. So I don't see, I, I came a long way, but I still think that I have a long way to go. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, just as, as, as your friend and as a, you know, a personal testimony to what I have witnessed, you know, I, I would say that characterization of, your faithfulness and dedication to whatever you put your mind to has been wholeheartedly shifted to your study of the word of God and, and your dedication to Jesus Christ. And, and honestly, it's, it's, it's a, it's an encouragement and it's an inspiration to us here at, at the Bible Baptist church. Oh, glory to but God. Now, when did you come to Deland to go to Bible school? How did you come across brother James? And then how did, how did you end up here at the Bible school? All right. Well, when I was uh, when I was on fire for witnessing and really answering questions and so forth, um, I talked to Pastor Knight alone, and I told him, I said, you know, brother, can you teach us more classes? You know, I want to learn more. I want to learn more. I want to learn more. So finally, he grabbed a handful of us, uh, the young, uh, younger Christians, you know, so to speak, you know, younger in the faith Christians, yeah. and he. He offered us, uh, and he did his he did his homework on this, and he found out there was a Bible college that was in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. It was a newly uh, a newly opened Bible college, and he said he knew the guy fairly well. He he knew the guy uh, was a solid preacher and so forth, and uh, said that if if we we would pray about it and just consider maybe going to that Bible college. So I went home and I talked with Becky about it. You know, we, we literally prayed to God and asked God, you know, for his direction mm -hmm. and thought about it, came up to our own conclusions. And I said, uh, sure. I, I, I just don't have the, mo the money to go, but maybe I can just save some money as I, you know, get a job, get some work. And Around that time, I lost my job when I did have one at that time because we were looking for work and I found one for a little while and then they laid me off. Mm -hmm. And so we weren't able to pay our bills in which I lost the house, that three bedroom house we were living in. I lost that house. Sure. Um, me and Becky started struggling too at the time uh, in our marriage. And so just kind of, things were like going down again for me um, at the point in time when I was trying to be the most faithful to the Lord. Sure. And Brother Knight stepped in with the pastor, Pastor Robinson, and they helped us. Uh, they helped us get a place with one of the church members that owned an apartment complex. Wow. And let us stay there. And the church paid them our rent. Oh, wow. While I was trying to figure out what I was going to do about Bible school, let alone having a job to support myself. Sure. So 
me and Becky were in a hard time right there. And Brother Knight told me one day, he says, Brother, I know you're looking for work. I know you haven't found nothing. I want to offer you a job here right now at a church and just do some painting in the Sunday school room or in the, the youth room. So I went there and, and we were painting the wall and I was just trying to earn some money. Yeah. And as he was talking to me while we were painting, he said, Brother Ed, have you ever thought about, you know, right now you're trying to make a decision to go to Bible school. All this stuff just happened to you. You, know, you lost your job. You know, you, 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 your house is gone. You know, all this stuff's happening to you right now. Do you think that maybe, and I, I'm not saying it's what it is, but do you think maybe God's like detaching you from this place? Wow. And I, I was just kind of, you know, <laughs> kind of confused, you know, when he said that to yeah. me. And I just kind of sat and thought about it. And I'm, and I'll go home and I talk to Becky and I said, this is what Brother Knight said. And so she's like, yeah, it's, it's weird how it's all working out like this. And so Brother Knight ends up meeting up with me later on that week. And he, he tells me that um, he, he and the church and Pastor Robinson, they, they all got together and they talked about sending me through church funds wow. to go to school. Wow. So they all had a meeting. They all agreed. They want to send me off. And uh, I went to the, the that Bible college. They sure. sent me off to that Bible college. So I enrolled. I, I, and then I found out on the way there that the job that I had for the longest time, as, as we were on our way to the Bible college, driving in the vehicle, the, the job that I worked for the longest had a, a, a faculty of that job called me and said that I had 401k that I could liquidate if I choose to do so. Wow. So I used that and it was like a blessing. I, I didn't realize I had it, but you know, but it, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in one way it's like a blessing, in you know, another way it's not because you want your 401k, 401k for when you retire. Sure. But I was having to use it and kind of withdraw it and get and pay the penalty fees, but it did meet a time in my life where I needed it. Right. And so it did help me. It helped us get a place when we were in Arkansas. And so, so here I have like a U-Haul and and cars and, and, and like a, a car full of all my belongings and we're in there and in a house we, we rent a house right across the street from the from the college and so we're there and we move all our furniture in this in this this place and we're going to school we're going through the motions we're going to school there and as I'm there I'm getting and I'm, I'm trying to make a long story short on a lot of this sure. and it's we're being taught a lot of tradition. Right. We're being taught out of believing my King James Bible. The thing that I had foundation for when I left the my home church where I was from. Right. And they're challenging me out of believing my King James Bible. And they're saying, well, this word doesn't mean this. And, and I remember a specific instance when I was sitting in the sanctuary and they have, uh, they got this thing called chapel services. And what it is is, each day when the classes are over, you actually have like a church service. Right. So you're literally having church every day. And sure. you're getting a sermon being preached to you every single day of the week. Sure. So I'm in the chapel meeting and, the, and one of the professors is up there. They asked to preach the, the sermon. And he sits there and he's quoting Revelation 4.11. And he says, see the word where it says pleasure? And he says, well, in the Greek... That word is will. So see, the, that's where the King James got it wrong there. It's will. It, the word is will, according to God's will. And I was, out of already a bunch of this kind of preaching that I've already heard already in that, in that place, I was, I was already up to my neck sure. in this kind of a Bible correction. And, and I was told, you know, over time as I was there from, my, from, from Pastor Eric Knight, you know, because I needed counseling from him. Like, well, I, I keep hearing these guys correcting my Bible. What am I going to do? And, <laughs> and he keeps giving me advice. He says, brother, you got to take the good, throw out the bad. Take the good, throw out the bad. Take the good, throw out the bad. Repetitiously, he had to keep telling me that. And each time I'd call him back, he had to keep telling me the same thing because it was bothersome to me. Sure. And I'm like, I don't want to be taught by somebody that's correcting the Bible. He, he's teaching me the wrong way. Right. So, so I'm sitting there. 
and he, that guy's preaching on, you know, the word, the word pleasure means will. And that time right there, I was done. I said, I, I, in my mind, I was, I, got, I had my mind made up. I closed my Bible right in the middle of that sanctuary. And I walked out. Wow. I went straight to the, to the faculty, to the front office. And I dropped all my classes, every class. I didn't even finish out the semester. I, I dropped all my classes. <laughs> I was done. I didn't want to be taught because uh, Pastor Knight told me, he says, now you can go through it and just Take the good, throw out the bad, or you can just drop your classes and then maybe we can search for a place that will uh, teach you uh, the inspired, preserved word of God right. in the light of that belief. Right. So I said, so I had my mind made up when he gave me that choice. And I was like, I'm done. Because I just couldn't drop my classes. They were suppo- they were paying for this. Right, right. So um, now, now, mind you, they weren't paying for everything. Right. So there was some of the tuition I had to pay myself. Sure. So I was, <laughs> while I was there, I was working at this place called AmeriCall. It was a telemarketing agency, but it was owned by the church. Really? Yes. Believe it or not. I don't know. Some people get really skeptical about that. I know I was skeptical when I <laughs> yeah. found out about that. And I ended up actually working there, you know, supporting it. But, uh, but I worked there and I was only making a few bucks here and there. It's really small, small change. Right. And I was having to use that money to pay my rent where I was living and my tuition. Right. So wherever I was coming short, you know, the church would help out. Gotcha. So I was really, we were living off ramen noodles most of the, most of the time. I mean, we really weren't doing much as far as going out anywhere, you know, like going out to eat, I'm not clubs and bars. I, I, we, we, we didn't do that anymore, but just going out to eat and just, you know, doing maybe a few, you know, things like taking trips. We wouldn't do anything. We, right. We'd be plastered to the house and just live there. And we're always there. We're either there or at the church. That's it. Or we're engaging in witnessing, going door to door, whatever. But that's basically, it was just only the ministry and that's it. And so as I'm there, you know, we're, we're doing our thing. Uh, finally, uh, after dropping all my classes, Brother Knight, I, I let Brother Knight know, and he tells me, he says, uh, "You've got to talk to Pastor Robinson because you know the whole the whole deal about them supporting us." So I called up Pastor Robinson and I said, "Hey, uh, hey, Pastor, I I really appreciate you know everything you guys do for me. I always write you guys letters every month. I appreciate everything you guys are doing for me, and." Um, if you want to drop your support for me, that is fine. I, I am I am with you on that. I just want to let you know that your money wasn't given in vain. And you can tell the church that. But I I am fully persuaded in my mind that this is not the place for me. And then uh, and I'm gonna stick this part in there because I didn't sure. include it. Sure. But I did tell Pastor Robinson about this, so it'll kind of add to that part of the story. Right, right. Brother Knight gave me seven CDs of the Bible definition of the church by Pastor James Knox. <laughs> yeah. And I listened to them. And I was, I am literally being taught out of the Bible. And when I hear this man preach, he believes the King James Bible is the inspired preserved right. word of God. Yeah. And that his doctrine of the church is different from the doctrine of the church that they believe in this school. Right. So that's that so I told the pastor that is two major deals there. So he, here I talked with Pastor Knight. I, I'm telling the pastor this. So I, I, I'm telling uh, Pastor Robinson I said, "Now I talked with with Pastor Knight and I was given a piece of paper in this church from the Romans and uh, the Romans instructor, the Romans right. teacher, he gave me this piece of paper and he told me he respects my stand on the King James Bible. So not everybody in this church is standing together unified sure, sure. on certain doctrines. And so what he's doing, he's hiring different people from yeah. all over yeah. the place and they don't know what each other believes, right. which you're going to have this diverse diversity of teachings that may contradict all the other teachings. Mm-hmm. So it's really not a good place for me to learn the Bible. So I'm being taught Calvinism in one area. I'm being taught right. Baptist brighter stuff in another area. So that's what he gave me. And I told the pastor, he gave me this paper that was dealing with Baptist brighter, but I couldn't recognize it. I didn't know what it was. Sure. So I read it. So I told Pastor Robinson, I said, I read him the paper over the phone. 
And he said that, uh, Brother Ed, that is full Baptist brighter, full blown Baptist brighter teaching. Yeah. And so your Romans instructor believes this, and he's he's gonna be teaching you this. Yeah. And I said, uh, but I t- and I told him I said I want to be taught this. So then, so that's so I told I told Pastor Robbins that's one area, and there's other areas, and then there was the compromise of of music that they were doing in the church at that time too. They were going more contemporary. Now. Sure. So they were getting away from hymns and more towards these these contemporary songs that were on the radio. So I said, that isn't that alarming as much as it is when somebody questions the King James Bible, but it it's still alarming. Right. And then I and then I told him about how I got rebuked when I went to the uh when I when I went to go uh, street preach, instead of going to the Easter egg extravaganza, <laughs> with the pastor wanted everybody there at the Easter egg extravaganza because he was going to be preaching to over like a five hundred to a thousand people there, sure. in which I ended up preaching to like thirty thousand over at the horse track, <laughs> <laughs> and he got pretty upset when the bus captain ended up telling him that uh, that that's what I went to go do and. So I, I I had my 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 time and share of rebuke, and I told the pastor that I said, "How do you get rebuked for preaching to a bunch of bus kids, the 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 law, and tell and going through the law in the Old Testament and showing them that 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 all have sinned and come short of the glory of God?" Right. And I got rebuked for that because sure. the pastor was the driver of the bus, and he he was he was <laughs> he was yeah. glaring at me through the rearview mirror, and and like shaking his head no as he was turning red, and then rebuked me after we dropped off all the bus kids and says, "Don't you ever preach to those kids that message again." Really? And all I did was preach the law to them and, and tell them that's why they needed Jesus Christ to believe on Jesus. And some of the kids were scared and they were like, yeah, I did. I did tell lies and, right. and, and I did commit that sin and they were scared and he didn't want me preaching that to him. So, so I told the pastor all this, right? The pastor's listening to all this and I'm like, this is just the few things that I'm mentioning. There's way more than this that yeah. I had a problem with in this, in this place. And I just kept getting, you know, I just kept putting my mind at ease by telling myself, I'm just going to take the good and throw out the bad. Sure. And I said, I can't do it anymore. I'm not, I'm done throwing out the good and the bad. It's mainly bad. It's mainly bad. I'm getting, if I throw out the bad, I'm getting nothing. <laughs> so I told him I, I had to make, I had to make up my mind pastor. And, and I'm telling you, I'm fully persuaded in my mind that pastor Knox and that and that church and that school that he's got, that's where I want to go. I said, I apologize. I was naive about going to that first place. I was entrusting uh, Brother Knight to direct me the right way. I didn't go online because at the time you, you had a computer you could get online and look at a website. Sure. I said, I didn't get online. I didn't study what the church believed. I didn't, I didn't look at their doctrinal statement. But now I'm more in line. I'm more keen in knowing what I want to be taught. Yeah. And I said, if you just bear with me with that um, and just understand that th- this is the, the transition right here that I'm going through. And I want to go to this church called the Deland or, or the school called the Deland School of the Bible. And I am fully persuaded that that's where I'll be and I'll finish. I will finish that, that school. And, and so he, 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 he told me, I told him all that, right? There's a lot of stuff I just load, loaded full, right? Yeah. So he he tells me, he says, uh, Brother Ed, he says, I, I appreciate you. You're honest. You know, you, you called me. You let me know. You know, you're always honest. You, you always you know, write us letters. You, you let us know where you stand. I want to know. I want to know. Just as for me and, and the church. I want to know if you go there, if you go there to that to that place in Florida. Yeah. Is are is is do you believe in the heart of your hearts? That's where the Lord wants you. Sure. That's what, that was this that was this big million dollar question right there because yeah. uh, that I mean he wants to know if if it's if it's uh, if I believe I'm fully persuaded that it's of God. Right. My answer right away was yes. Yeah. Because I'm saying God, God would not want me to learn His Bible. He would not want me to learn that the King James Bible, the inspired, preserved Word of God, when He made a promise in the Word of God that He would have a book that had that. Sure, it's from God. And I didn't have any problem with my mind telling Him it was from God because I truly believe in the heart of my heart that it was of God. Sure. 
So I'm making a decision for God, not myself. I'm not saying, if I wanted to make a decision for myself, I could have just went through the motions and finished and got a piece of paper. I could have got a degree. Right. But I said, and that's what, that was one of the things that Brother Knight had told me, talking to me and trying to encourage me. He says, brother, you could go to uh, this church and not get a piece of paper. Right. Not walk away with anything that will hold your that you could hold your head up high in the sense you're in society you can get a job anywhere because you got a degree, or you could hold up your head up high which wouldn't be the same as what, you know the world looking at you but you could hold your head up high knowing the Bible right so which one would you rather have I yeah. said I want to hold up my head for God yeah I want to hold up my head knowing the Bible and he says okay well that you see you got to count the cost for that and he says well how does your family feel about that I said they don't they don't want me to drop the school. They want me to get that piece of paper. They want me to get, be able to have uh, bragging rights and, and to be able to have that piece of paper to back me up. And I could be able to get a job anywhere at any church. Right. And um, I said, well, that's to me that I'm falling away from, sure. from, from what my convictions are about what I need to do for the Lord. Yeah. It's too much of a compromise for you. So I said, um, I, I think in the long run, it'll pay off. But in the short term, it won't because everybody's going to be angry at me because I'm making a, <laughs> uh, what they consider a hasty decision and sacrificing what people have have been sacrificing for me their their sure. hard earned money and and I don't want to take that lightly. That's why I'm you know and that's why I talked to the pastor as well on the phone. So from that point, I was fully persuaded. I, I didn't have any doubts. I mean, some people have doubts. Yeah. This is one thing I had no doubt about because I've, I listened to those seven CDs and in the three months left that we were there in Arkansas, those three CDs that I received after I already dropped all my classes, we went to church, right? We went to church. I, I dropped all my class. We went to church and the pastor is preaching sermons against me oh. <laughs> that I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing when I didn't talk to anybody about why I left, except wow. for the faculty, the people that, that wanted to know and asked me why I'm leaving. Yeah. I've never tried to persuade anybody to leave that church sure. and because I already knew a truth about that. And I already knew that we shouldn't be, you know, divisive in churches and trying to draw people out of churches. So I already knew that truth before going into this thing. So I made sure that I didn't try to draw anybody away or, hey, you know, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, let me tell you about some some of what <laughs> yeah. they're doing here. Yeah. You know, I I, didn't, I wouldn't do that. I'd right. keep my mouth shut. I wouldn't talk to anybody about it. I just said, I'm going to leave quietly. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to disrespect the pastor. I'm not going to disrespect the faculty. I'm going to leave quietly. That way there can be no contention after I leave or some historical sure, remembrance sure. of how I was this guy that came and tried to divide the church. So that's kind of where I was at. And then so, so the three months... Because Becky was still going to the church, and I said, "Well, if I don't go anymore, if I don't go to the church anymore, maybe they won't preach against me anymore." Because they, they, they were trying to do it every service. Oh, so I let Becky go, and I wouldn't go, and so she could still get partake of the service, and I would just stay home, and I was just transcribing Brother James, one of James, Brother James's CDs on the church because I had those. Yeah, so I was just transcribing it. And that's what I would do for my church. Well, Becky told me that. They preached a sermon against me while she was there without oh. me. And so she says, I was so angry that I didn't want to, I don't want to go back. So she, she I, didn't, I didn't tell her not to go. She didn't want to go. Sure. So I said, well, we've got to go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. So I guess what, after I'm done transcribing all these CDs, I'm just going to preach what Brother James already or Pastor Knight already preached on these CDs. And so we started having service at the house for three months, <laughs> faithfully, only preaching on those seven CDs. That's, that's what I did. I, pre I didn't know anything. Yeah. But I knew what those CDs said was absolutely correct. Sure, sure. So that's, and that's all I knew. And so what happened was during the three months, our landlady came over and she was like a, she was from some other denomination. And she came, she started, she wanted to partake of her <laughs> services. So I was, I'm, I'm sitting here preaching to three people, you know. So it was good. So we, so we did Amen. that. <laughs> but the reason why we had to stay three months afterwards is because I was trying to pay off that tuition. 
Right. I didn't want to, uh, like I said, I wanted to leave on the best testimony that I could. Didn't want to say anything bad about the church. I, I, I wanted to leave graciously and I wanted to pay off all my tuition so nobody can say, Brother Ed was a bum. He, he just tried to use us. He didn't even right. pay his tuition. Right. Uh, I mean, I was... I was on the dean's list with distinction. If I mean, if that means anything, I sure. mean, my grades were like everything was like above above the the excellent grade you could get. I, I was above that. I did every extra credit assignment I could ever do in that whole year. I was like the the pinnacle of of what these guys would consider a an extreme an extreme testimony to Christianity. Sure. So they would want me around their students all the time to kind of disciple their students and stuff. And they didn't even see me as a student. They saw me more as a as an example to students and more as a teacher than a student. So my testimony, I tried to keep it impeccable when I was there, mm-hmm. but I didn't see myself that way. I just, I mean, all, all Christians should be acting. I mean, come on, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not, don't consider me no pinnacle of anything. Yeah. I come short of the glory of God. I mean, you, if you take a magnifying glass out in my life, you're going to see the flaws just like anybody else's life. But the reason why I said that, and I give you a little testimony about that, is because going, coming here to the Deland School of the Bible from there, I had to make a pit stop at my home church. They wanted me to come home. Right. And he said, I, we don't want you to go to uh, Deland, uh, Deland, Florida right away. And uh, we've we've got something for you when you get down here. Like, uh oh, what, what is this? You know, we're gonna disown you as a member of the church. Uh, so I went there, and uh, Pastor Knight was was there. Uh, Pastor Robinson was there, and he asked me before I leave to preach a sermon. Amen. I could preach on whatever topic I wanted, and I preached on the Word of God. And, I t- I, and it was dealing with Daniel chapter three. Uh-huh. And I preached on the word of God that is inspired and preserved. And it's found in the King James Bible. And I don't know as such as if the pastor was that dogmatic about it like <laughs> I was, but they used the King James Bible. And if you're familiar with a lot of churches, sure. some of them just prefer to use King yeah, James. Yeah. They don't really like hold to it as the inspired, preserved word of God. So I don't know if he did believe it that way to this day. I, I I would like to assume he did because he didn't rebuke my sermon. But at the same time, they took up an offering to get me to the land. Wow. And that's where, because I was trying to make money to 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 get over there and we didn't I didn't have a job, you know. So I was just going by their money and whatever I had left from the from the little, you know, minute amount of money that I got from that telemarketing place. And we tried to save whatever we could. We ended up selling all our furniture, everything. We sold everything. Wow. Um, all my my devices, all my furniture, ev- anything. And we came here in just our vehicles. Didn't have no U-Haul. Remember I came in a U-Haul? <laughs> yeah. in there? No, we didn't have a U-Haul this time. Right. We, we sold everything because I, I had my mind made up that if I can't get there through support from the church, I was either going to sell everything and I was just going to work until I could get enough money to make it but there was no way that I was not going to come. Amen. So I, I had my mind made up. So they they was great. They were very gracious. They were really nice to me at Victory Baptist Church, and they they took up that offering and it helped us get here. And and again, we had that extra money that we sold all our belongings and possessions and just came here with the bare minimum of what we had and the clothes on our backs. And uh, we got here and. Um, right when and I'm telling you, right when I walked through the door and the very first time I saw Brother James. He said, he, he, he told me, he says, you guys look like you just got out of prison. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> we did. Yeah. And, and and in my heart and in my mind, I'm like, this guy can read right through me and I just met him. <laughs> you just got out of a, a form of bondage. <laughs> so, so, so look, I mean, coming from there to here, it was like refreshing. It was, yes. you, you know, right. Before before I got here, like like uh, like it was like a maybe not even a month before we got here, uh, or t- to this church, and I was still in Arkansas uh, before we even got to Victory. I watched a video that Brother McGee had made from right. this church. Right. He had a video online, and it was about the outreach, 
and and the march for Jesus. Yeah. And when I watched that, brother, I had tears in. I had literally, I had tears <laughs> in my eyes, because everywhere that I've went, whether it was Victory or Arkansas or any other church that we've ever visited in between, nobody ever had any ministry or witnessing like that. Right. Nobody ever had like 15, 20, maybe 30 percent of their church, which is huge. Yeah. To yeah. go out and witnessing where where you you can look and all four corners of the street corner full of people with signs and, and people opening up their mouths. And, and me and Becky are watching that. And I just had tears in my eyes as I was watching. I'm like, there ain't no way this, this church does not exist. <laughs> yeah. And when we came here, it was everything that I thought it was. Because some people, you know, they come to a church and they, they have high expectations and they say, well, they hear Brother James preaching and they're expecting everybody to live to the standard of what Brother James is preaching in his sermons. And I I, I was a practical person at the time in sure, that sense. Sure. I knew everybody wasn't going to be a little Pastor Knox yeah. running around here. Yeah. But I did know that in this church, they had a desire to yeah. serve God in a sense that's more than most churches I've, I've ever known or seen. Right. So to me, it was like, this is another creature here. <laughs> yeah. This is a, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, but that's not what all churches are. But when I got here, I saw the new creature here. And I was like, yeah, I want to be part of this. Amen. This is going to be good. Yes, sir. And so the first times I went out to the street corner, man, I was so amazed. I could not believe my eyes. I couldn't believe my ears for the for the boldness and the and the just the desire to, by young people as well as older folks, to just serve God. Because I was like, you know, usually you're going to get a little age group that's going to desire to do something in any church most of the time. Right. And this, in this case, it was like really, like diverse with everybody kind of, or I'll, I'll say most everybody kind of on board with, you know, doing all the ministries and just getting the message out. Whether it's, I mean, you got something to do every day of the week. Right. And where I was going, they a lot of churches they're closing on Wednesday. They sure. don't even they're not even open. You can't even access a pastor or a or a faculty member. So to me, this was like life changing for me. And it was like, this is what I need for me and my family. This is what I need for my you know my daughter. I I, I need a place where I can raise my family correctly, and get solid Bible teaching. Yeah. And and that way my my daughter can say well. The norm isn't one percent or two percent trying to love Jesus and honor Him by going out to witness. Right. right. So, so I want to change that in her mind. So, and it did. As we were here for many years now, my daughter still gets surprised at certain churches if we go visit how they are. You know, yeah. she she's like, "Daddy, they're not doing it like this." Or, Daddy, they're, <laughs> yeah, because they're not going by the Bible in some of these churches. I mean, so and and I like her to to see more of a norm of how she's living her life in church. So to me, it was like, every, in every respect, a great thing. And that's true. Every church has problems. Every church has its problems. But I wanted to be around a, a church that's striving, not, not, not to just remain in their problems, but right. striving to overcome. And, yeah. and that's, that's what I see in this church. Sure. So even though you, know, you have your issues in, in every church, how does each church handle those issues? Or do they just remain you know, in their in their you know, their problems and their issues, or will they overcome? Or or do they or is there a desire to overcome? You know, mm -hmm. they may not even overcome, but is there a desire to to get past it? Right. And I, I think most churches are dead. Most churches won't do anything. Most churches uh won't even have a a soul winning ministry, let alone, you know, having a prayer meeting or something like that. I mean they, they struggle even with that. Just you're you're in the church house and you're just getting together. People are too lazy to go do that. So there's a lot of laziness in the church and I think it's just a lot of it's due to our culture. But uh but sure. I do appreciate coming here and uh just seeing the work ethic yeah from Brother James, Brother David and many of the faculty here. Uh and just seeing great Christians and how they serve God. Uh enforces me to even be more uh diligent in right. how I how I want to be. Right. And so I, I I don't by no means do I look at people and try to compare myself. I always look at people and say, I need to be better. Sure. And uh so I I've never looked down to people. I never talk down to people. I, I, I think that every person, no matter even if they're a carnal Christian, uh they're saved. They contributed uh you know that that part of their life 
to the Lord and said, you know, I'm going to give this part of my life to the Lord. So that's a great start. And I think uh, every carnal Christian has potential to become a great Christian. You just got to, you got to have a starting point like I did. So what is your role here now at the church? Well, I'm the mole in the hole. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, wear, wear many hats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jack of all trades, master of all. I guess you, you could say it like that. Or, yeah. or at least I, ha- I have to try to be. Um, I, I'm the I'm the manager here at the church house. If you, I mean, when, when you when you say that, like like when I say manager, <laughs> nobody understands what that is. Right. I mean, I, I went home and they were asking me, you know, what are you? What are you in the Bible Baptist Church? What is your position there? You know. And I'm like, I'm the manager. What what is that? I don't yeah. understand that. I'm like, well, it's a okay. Think of Brother David, but think of Brother David. Uh, you know, think of like. Like almost two brother Davids. How about <laughs> sure, that? Sure. Yeah, brother David, and you got another brother David. Right. And they're both doing kind of the same thing, but the other brother David's doing something a little bit different. Like right. he's not doing the preaching for the youth and stuff like that. But I'm doing a lot of the other things. Like I do a lot of ordering for the church, you know, uh, ordering tracks yeah. and uh, stocking books and uh, answering emails and phone calls. So, and, and it's huge. People think that that's a small, that's a small task. It's more of like a clerk or a secretary, more of a secretarial thing. And it is, it, it's more of in line with that, but uh, we need somebody here that can represent the church sure. um, the right way and represent the doctrines of the church in the right way. So it's not a light thing to be able to pick up a phone and answer somebody's question. If you're going to give an answer that represents the the doctrines of the church, that's huge. So I've got to make sure I know what we believe as the church, not my own personal beliefs. Right, I've right. got to know what we represent as the church. So that's that's tasking in itself because many times I'm, and, and, and I think I'm kind of, I've kind of drilled myself into the norm of what we believe as the church and studied them diligently of all of our doctrines mm-hmm. and what we need, uh, how we need to present things. And and I think that's also a major thing when you're dealing with people on a phone or on in an email is having grace and and a and a, a nice spirit about you right. that you're not you know tearing people down and trying to destroy people instead of helping them. And I think that that's what this job is all about. It's a ministry and in, in ministerial work, your ministry is servitude and help. So you want to help people the best way you know how. And a lot of times the best start for help is the the right spirit, having the right spirit when you're talking to people. Cause then if they know that, that you're, you're a humble person, you have humility, they'll want to know your answer. They'll want to hear what you got to say. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's very important. So I definitely try to be the best example that I can be in the church as a manager here and as a representative of Christianity and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and for his glory, uh, uh, of course. But sure, uh, the the jobs that I do are very various and um, it, it, it's not singled out to where you can just have this list of things that right. you do. This is your job description. Right. I'm pretty much, and, and I've learned this over the years, multitasking is basically your ministry. You, yeah. You're pretty much doing <laughs> seven different things at one time. Yeah. And, and you just you're just happy because you're doing it for the Lord, Amen. you know. And yeah. even though you can you can get wore out, just like you work for a, a business or any other company or or production company, uh, you can do like seven different things at one time and get wore out. I, I believe that the same thing applies in the ministry. You can really wear yourself out. You got to make sure not to take more than you can handle, and, uh, and and not let it get get to you. And where bitterness can can root into your life and. Uh, resentment uh, towards your leadership mm-hmm. and that can easily come into effect to any of us and, and me included. So you definitely want to stay with it. You want to be, uh, you know, Christian first, you know, Christian honoring Jesus Christ first and then a job second. So, uh, but I do hold my job in high esteem. I don't take it lightly. A lot of people can't even, even fathom a job like I'm doing because it doesn't exist in most churches. Right. Uh, and I'm telling you, the, the job that I do is only for a church that is going to be doing uh, right, ministerial right. services and uh, things that are biblical for the Lord all the time in Christian lifestyle every day of their lives. That's the only way you can get a, a, a position like this that I'm doing. Sure. So most churches will have no need for my position because right. they won't even open during the week, like I said earlier. And um, there's no real outreach mm-hmm. except for maybe the one lady going door knocking yeah. on a Sunday afternoon. So, but it's great. I, I, I've never regretted 
first of all, ever becoming a Christian, never regretted my walk that I've had traveled from, from the time I was young till now. Yeah. Because I can look back and see every point in time where the Lord helped me. Even though I didn't recognize it at the time, I can look back and say, yeah, the Lord helped me there. The Lord helped me there. The Lord helped me there. And, and then I'm here where I'm at right now. And I can just say, I don't regret it. Uh, it there, there certainly would have been regret if I never got saved and I died in my own sins. But sure. I have no regrets. I've regretted a lot of sin in my life. I've regretted a lot of things that right, I've done wrong right. in my life. But never the Lord, never the Bible, never trying to seek going to school and learning more about the Lord. And, and I, I, I even changed my position on I was going to be a pastor. When I left from uh, Victory Baptist to come to Bible school, the goal was, whether I was in Arkansas or here in Florida, the goal was for me to come back and and replace the pastor. That was the goal. Wow. Uh, Brother Knight wasn't going to get the position. Right. It was me. They wanted me to get the position. Sure. So taking Holy Spirit class here at the Bio Baptist Church, yeah. I learned so much in that course of the Holy Spirit that, and you know, and, and as, as honest as I try to be with everybody, because I came here, I was still getting supported a missionary check right. to finish school here from Victory Baptist Church. So they were still supporting me. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to be honest with them. So I called them and I told them, uh, I I have to ask you guys to not send me any more missionary checks. And I Amen. did this for a while. I did this for a while. They would not. They would <laughs> not budge. They would, they would still wanted to keep sending me missionary checks. And I had heard people abusing missionary checks that were actual missionaries. Sure. And, and I'm pretty sure you heard of stories like sure. that as well. Yeah, and people will take that yeah. money and they will do something else with it. They'll live right. off room service or something. And with me, I was like, yeah, I heard all these stories and I don't want for one minute in my, in my conscience, in my mind as a saved member of the body of Christ to ever put any doubt on, on somebody giving me money from the church to right. use that money correctly. Right. And so I was, I took it a toll upon myself. I was beating myself up all the time whenever I get a check. I'm like, man, do I really need this? Is this really, I mean, it's going to go for what it needs, but I already got a job. I'm already paying my, my schooling and my schooling is free. Right. So I was, I was really convicted about that. I did not want to get a missionary check if I had a job and and these people sending me checks and I'm like, I, I just want to give it back to them and let them send it to a missionary that really needs it. Sure. So that's what I did. I kept I, I kept writing them letters. I called them. I called the treasurer. I called uh, Brother Knight. I called Pastor Robinson. <laughs> uh, over time, over that time span, you know, while I was going to school, and I just said, "Hey guys, you know, I love you. I appreciate everything you guys do for me. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Um, I really, I really thank you guys so much for your encouragement and provoking me to do and live the life that I'm living now. But I had changed my mind about being a pastor. I'm not coming back." I'm not coming back. And that was a hard thing to tell them. Sure. I'm going to stay here. And I want my my daughter to grow up here. And I, I do apologize. I know the intention was for me to come back. And uh, what can I say? I, I have no excuses to, in that area to tell you. But uh, the, the reason why I'm calling is to tell you, to formally tell you that I am doing this. And if you want to draw withdraw missionary support from me, I, I, I'm trying to tell you as soon as possible, as soon as I found out, you know, here I am calling you and I don't want you to pay for things. And, and, and I can recompense everything that you guys ever, ever paid me. I'll, I'll do my best to pay it back. Right. And so Pastor Robinson said, brother Ed is the Lord, is the Lord calling you to be there to do, to do what you're doing? And I said, yes. And he says, okay, we are going, we are going to still send you missionary support. <laughs> until, and we said, we had agreed here at the church that we were going to send you missionary support until you completed school. Wow. And I said, okay. And I said, and I'm going to complete it. And then and he was like, okay. And then so finished uh, or, or a little bit, a little bit towards finishing. Because I told you it was an off and on thing. I kept calling them and calling them and telling them to withdraw the support. Finally, I called them and I talked to the treasurer this time. And uh, he, I, I told him, I said, can you do me a huge favor? Can you talk to the pastor seriously in a one-on-one? I mean, serious. I mean, t- 
tell him this is serious. <laughs> and sit with him and talk to him and tell him that uh, Brother Ed is fully persuaded in his mind that you guys just need to withdraw this missionary support because he just really sincerely wants some other missionary that's that you guys are supporting to get this money. Sure. And I said, would you do that for me? It'd be a huge favor. So he hung up with me and he called me back later. And he told me, he says, Brother Ed, I talked with the pastor. He uh, he told me, he said, uh, he's going to honor your request. He's going to wow. withdraw missionary support. And they're going to give it to a missionary that needs it. And he just says, brother, I just want, he and, and Gene talked to me on the phone. He says, brother, I really appreciate you. I, you you're you're the most you're one of the most honest guys that I know. Yeah. He says, you 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 took that money and we could tell that you were trying to do your best. So uh we that money did not go to waste. Amen. How does your I, I guess let, let's let's end with this question. This is one of my one of my favorite questions. How does your daily life reflect your faith in Jesus Christ? We just the, the salvation that he's given me showed worth and value to abuse that. Yeah. Certainly would be sinful. Sure. But every day should be a day that you see the goodness of God. Right. Every day you look to the one that gave you existence and you just say, why? Why would you create specks of dust and then give your life for those specks of dust? And you just got to look to that and live every day. And it's, it's really not hard when you're living for a God that, love, that loves you. Yeah. As far as daily living, you wake up in the morning and you you just you got God on your mind, you got Jesus on your mind, and you're just like, I mean, I don't know, if, I don't know what other people do, but you're asking personally me. Sure, it's like another day of life, right? Another day to enjoy the blessings of God and try to not abuse those blessings by trying to live the life that He needs you to live, not just for you know, keeping some laws and rules, but you <laughs> you live for Jesus, you're blessed. It, it, it truly is a blessing just to live for him and, and it helps you in your life. Right. So to me, it's like the reflection of Jesus in my life is just uh, living every day for him, teaching my family of the Lord and getting in his word, honoring his word and uh, witnessing his word in my life and always being mindful of my testimony to others because sure. my testimony can tear down others because People know where I stand. People know where 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 I, where I am in the Lord. They know that when they look at that guy, they know that guy. You know that bald headed guy right there. He, <laughs> he always has a Bible. That bald headed guy right there. He's pre he preaches out on the street. So it's there. There is an element of burden burden on you where you don't want to come short in people's minds that you're not the Christian that you said you were, and you do mess up. You do fall down. You do get back up. But you sure. try not to do it around lost people. You try not to do it around people that are that are carnal or people that, uh, no matter who they are, you don't just don't want to fall around people. Right. Uh, you try to make it a point not to because anytime you mess up and everybody's looking at you, it, it affects people. Right. So to have that, you know, try to be a reflection of that is tough. It's, it is burdensome, but it's right. Right. It's right to do. And- I think anything in life, we we always uh, burden ourselves to measure up to some standard of whoever we want to be around or wh whatever expectation people have of us. And I think what better to burden yourself than with the expectation God would have for you and look good in his eyes. So to me, that would be the best representation that I could give every day in my life to sure. people that are out in the world and to myself is to to sincerely try to live the best life I can live for him even though I do fall, come short and fall down sometimes. I think we just keep getting back up and just keep serving him to the best of our ability. Amen. All right. This last section is, is uh, these are rapid fire comparison and contrast questions. Uh -oh. I'm not good at those. <laughs> 
it, it's it, it gives a little insight into your personality and and it's little details that people argue over. Can I go slow? You can go, you can go as fast <laughs> or slow as you want. Okay. <laughs> Do you so, still try to think about it? <laughs> so I, I'm gonna call out two things, you know, that, that that contrast each other, and and you pick the one that appeals to you the most. All right. Okay. So the first one is call or text. Call. Call. All right. Book or ebook. Book book okay i thought you might go ebook there because you're you, you're a big electronics guy so <laughs> coke or pepsi 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 a lot of pepsi right <laughs> a lot of pepsi cats or dogs neither neither <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not one of the choices if worse came to worse it, it'd be dogs okay. i'm allergic to cats okay android or ios android yeah <laughs> sunrise or sunset Sunrise. Okay. Laundry or dishes? Dishes. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure Miss Becky hears that part. <laughs> she knows I'd rather do the dishes. <laughs> Mornings or nights? Nights. Coffee or tea? Tea. Tea. Okay. Fruits or vegetables? <laughs> Neither. Neither. Bacon. <laughs> All right, if I had to pick, and there's no ores in there. I don't want to be hard. Right. Uh, fruits or vegetables? Fruits. Okay. Um, sweet or salty? Sweet. Sweet. Uh, mountains or oceans? Mountains. Mountains. Now, this next one is the most important one to get right. Africa or Asia? <laughs> <laughs> Neither. <laughs> Delay of Florida. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Africa or Asia? Yeah. Africa. Uh, really? Okay. Is your your you have uh, your background is is uh, in part Indonesian, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, city or country? City. City. Serious or sarcastic? Serious. <laughs> I should pick sarcastic because I do a lot of it. But I, I, I really prefer serious. Amen. Well, brother, uh, you know, you, you're a blessing and an inspiration to me. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me to do this. And I really, really appreciate your, your, your openness and your honesty in doing this. I think it's going to be a huge blessing and encouragement to a lot of people. And, and I just really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Praise the Lord, brother. Thanks for having me. Glory to God. Amen, brother. Now, some of you might find it strange that a man would go to such lengths and care to make sure he was being taught the Word of God properly and truthfully. When a man or woman first trusts in Christ, they become newborn babes, whereby the Holy Spirit begins to reveal the truthful condition of the world around them. They begin to see things in a way that was impossible before. As such, they become vulnerable, impressionable, and hungry for truth. The trouble is navigating the world of falsehood, even by men who bear all the right titles, is unbelievably complicated. For Brother Ed... And for myself, as we ventured through this world of deceit, we praise God we found a man who was willing to honestly and thoroughly teach us God's perfect word. Brother James taught us to truthfully and properly believe the Bible. Now, if you have a desire to learn the word of God, I encourage you to look into the DeLand School of the Bible also known as the School of Hard Knocks. God bless you, and thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can learn more about our ministry by visiting www.plenteousredemption.com. You can hear more Plenteous Redemption podcast audio at www.plenteousredemption.media. Please comment below if this podcast has been a help to you. Also, inform us of future topics that would interest you. Thank you again for listening to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast.